Amen. If we bring our minds back to the last couple of presentations that have been been shared, what we were doing, what we have been doing, is revising uh, the history of World War II. We have been um, picking up those themes from what were presented really over over a year now, um, regarding focusing particularly on the history of World War II and there were two different witnesses that brought us to our understanding of what World War II was in history and how it teaches us of our own time. Those two witnesses were both presented um, for the, the first time in depth last October 2018 and the two witnesses were first I'll do them in order of presentation. First, the history of Acts 27 that brought us to Pyrrhus. The first witness, those two histories of Pyrrhus that brought us to World War II. And they've been taught thoroughly um, in great detail over the last uh, 14 months. So first, the Acts 27 that took us to the history of Pyrrhus and second, the counterfeit. Both of these show in, from slightly different perspectives, the importance of World War II, both in its own dispensation and also in ours, how we apply it to our own time. What the counterfeit gave us was an understanding of modern Babylon how we see modern Israel in an Alpha and an Omega history and then how we can compare and contrast that and see the counterfeit also in its Alpha history from 1899 to 1945. And when understanding the counterfeit, its 46 year history, we understand it as a counterfeit of the beginning of modern Israel from 1798 to 1844, 46 years of God gathering his people after the 1260 years of papal persecution. You have William Miller raised up as a reformer. 1798, you can already mark him on the line. You can mark the first angel's message, but it hasn't yet developed Miller is only a teenager. He hasn't yet started studying. He's going to become a deist, go to war. Um, he's going to be, go, become a deist and then, and then begin to study in 1816, 18 years after 1798. So you can see in this history that it takes time for the first angel's message to even begin to become a subject of that reform line, even though we mark its arrival in 1798. And then you see this is the history of the first and the second angel's messages <coughs> in that 46 year time span. This being the beginning of modern Israel, 1899, marking the beginning of modern Babylon. And you can see in 1899, there's a new leader of the Catholic Church raised up, Eugenio Pacelli. He's going to become a, a priest in 1899 and then he's going to study Code of Canon Law. He's going to completely restructure the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. He's going to go to Germany, going to work with Germany, bring Germany under his control, the most rebellious branch of the Catholic Church at that time. And then in 1939, he's going to become Pope Pius XII, the close... close interaction with, with Hitler and fascism in Europe. So in 1899, externally you can see, you can already see the seeds of World War I. It's the first Hague conference. It's going to be what develops into World War I. So in this history, the beginning of modern Israel, it's the history of the first and second angels' messages and they are what resurrects God's church, modern Israel. This history is the history of World War I and World War II and that's what resurrected the papacy financially and politically. And it all was happened, even World War I, under Eugenio Pacelli. 
first as a priest, then a, a, a bishop, cardinal, and finally the Pope, uh, Pope Pius XII. So this, this is just a revision of our last presentations. Um, just a reminder why World War II becomes so significant and then to remind us that as World War II is significant, so is World War I. Acts 27 took us to Pyrrhus and when we studied Pyrrhus, we saw that the Fourth Diadochi War introduced us to World War II. So the Fourth War of the Diadochi introduced us to World War II. That fourth war bringing us to World War II, we also understand that the Fourth Diadochi War was the fourth of a succession or four wars fought over the breakdown of Alexander's kingdom, but there was something particularly special about the third and the fourth. The first and the second wars, a great many generals all fighting together, but the third and the fourth war were different. The third and the fourth are really one war fought between the exact same parties, Antigonus and the Allies. So the third war and the fourth war were one war, one war between Antigonus and the Allies with an armistice in the middle. And if the fourth Diadochi War is World War II, what do you expect the third Diadochi War to be? It's going to need to be overlaid with World War I. So we've already taken through Acts 27 and Pyrrhus, we'd already taken the fourth Diadochi War, overlaid it with World War II, and it had given us the history of World War III, what we see in our own time. But a reminder again of one of our rules of Bible prophecy is the triple application, that we see a triple application of prophecy. We see in Revelation a description of the first woe, then a description of the second woe, and then when it comes to the third woe, how much information does it give us? Very little, because the first woe plus the second woe equals the third woe. You know what the third looks like because it's only a combination of the first and the second. So if we want to understand what the war in our time, the Third World War, all we have to do is World War I plus World War II equals World War III. That's one example of a triple application of prophecy. So through this understanding of the counterfeit, we know that World War I ties into this history. We know that World War I must tie in because of the triple application of prophecy and we also see it back in this history of the Diadochi Wars that the Third Diadochi War is the exact same parties fighting as was in the Fourth. So we began to, under to study first the Third Diadochi War. Uh, this being our top line, the Third Diadochi War, we began to study that in our last presentations. And I want to quickly revise that history. We'd seen that in this Diadochi War, after the death of Alexander, you have many generals fighting and over 22 years, it, his empire is finally divided up into those four famous generals that, that Daniel speaks about in Daniel 11 verse 4 and 8, 8. Our, our four winds of heaven, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus and Ptolemy. But in a, approximately 316 BC, about halfway through that, that process of, of the breakdown of his empire, there was at that point five generals left, five powerful generals fighting for the breakup of that empire. And those five we find to be Antigonus, who was in the fourth Diadochi War, the King of the North, and is fighting Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy, and at one point Seleucus. 
we find that um, through this time we usually only mark three at any point in time because there's always one missing. When you come to the Battle of Ipsus, Ptolemy didn't turn up. In the Third Diadochi War, Seleucus has lost all of his, his empire. So you find that we're usually only marking three allies whenever it actually comes into that history of war. But these are our four famous generals and they're fighting against Antigonus in the third as well as the fourth war. After the third ends, they make a temporary peace and then at the beginning of the fourth, they um, find another cause to, to reignite that conflict. So we gave a little history of how the Third Diadochi War began. Back into, back into the Second Diadochi War, there had been this, this conflict between two parties. Really, this is going into history that I, I don't think it is necessary to to complicate, but this is really the history of the rise of Cassander. And as C Cassander's father died, his father being one of the most powerful generals of Alexander the Great, Cassander's father dies and he did not leave his, his, his territory to his son. He left it to his own general. So Cassander's father left his, his territory to a general of his because he considered his son Cassander to not be worthy of it. So this started a, a war over that territory between Cassander and this general of his father's because Cassander wanted his father's territory. And this, this caused all of those other generals, Antigonus, uh, all those ones remaining, to take sides in this conflict, whether they were going to side with the general or Cassander. And as a breakdown, as this second Diadochi War um, occurred, many of these generals, uh, as Cassander started to win, started to turn on one of the most powerful generals of that time, Eumenes. So just to give the, really the conclusion of that second Diadochi War, you had Cassander defeat that general uh, take over the empire of his father and finally become a satrap. And that's why his name is on this board, because he won the Second Diadochi War. But through that conflict, the opponent of, him, of his was known as Eumenes. And Eumenes was one of the most powerful generals of that time. He had within his army what were known as the Silver Shields. And what, what do we call the elite fighting force in the, the, in the United States? What do we call them? Uh, Marines. Marines, there's another, there's another one. The Navy Seals. Seals. These are essentially Alexander the Great's Navy Seals. By the time you get into the history of this war, these men are in their 60s, their 70s, and they are still the most fearful opponents you could face on a battlefield. They are trained for decades under the Alexander the Great. They were Alexander's Navy, uh, Navy SEALs, essentially. And they fought for Eumenes, making him an extremely formidable force. So after Cassander wins that war, Antigonus is tasked with destroying Eumenes. The other generals say to Antigonus, um, he, Antigonus has, is rising in power, and they ask Antigonus to... <coughs> to take on the task of, of destroying Eumenes. And that's how the Second Diadochi War um, starts coming to a conclusion. With this war between Antigonus and Eumenes. So they've been fighting for some time and Antigonus has fought a number of battles with Eumenes that all seem to be fairly inconclusive until they finally meet at the battle the battle of Gabini now Eumenes has gone further and further east he, he's really his 
His power is in, is in the eastern part of Alexander's empire and partly because he wants to flee uh, and also partly because that's where he's, he has the most power. He, he's spread further and further east. And as he's gone further east, he's gone past Babylon, where Seleucus, which Seleucus now for a short period of time had had under his control. So as Eumenes is spreading east, he's coming across two other generals. And those two generals were Seleucus, two other satraps, I should say, uh, Seleucus and Python. And he was hoping that Seleucus and Python would take his side, but instead they've sided with Antigonus. Seleucus and Python fighting on behalf of Antigonus throughout uh, the final days of that war. In fact, even without Antigonus, uh, when Eumenes was in a vulnerable state, uh, they attacked him. So at this final battle, the Battle of Gabini, Antigonus faced off against Eumenes. Seleucus has been aiding Antigonus, but from the shadows. He hasn't actually fought in his army, but Python has. Python is fighting on behalf of Antigonus. In this war, in, the, in this battle of Gabini, the final battle, they're facing across from each other in the east and between their two armies is a vast salt plain. It's, it's extremely dry. And Antigonus begins that battle by a massive charge. Actually, I think it was Eumenes. One of them charges. It isn't incredibly uh, relevant. I think it was Eumenes, but I'll have the quotes. Um, I'm just going to give some quotes for this history. Eumenes was the most powerful general in the eastern part of that empire and he'd united the eastern satraps against Antigonus. He controlled the silver shields, Alexander's elite fighting force. Seleucus owed his position to Antigonus. He'd recently been given Babylon by Antigonus and he believed that Antigonus would win anyway. So instead of al allying with Eumenes, he allied with Antigonus and started to subtly work against Eumenes. At one vulnerable point, Seleucus and Python both attacked Eumenes and, um, and interfered with his, his troops. Python then joined the army of Antigonus who had come east to take out Eumenes. During uh, the final two battles, Paratakini and Gabini, Python commanded the left flank of Antigonus' army. At the Battle of Gabini, Eumenes began an advance forward and likely somewhat to his left. As the, elephants, as the armies closed the gap, the elephants, unsuited to the cold, were the first to engage. A great cloud of salt dust arose over Eumenes' end of the field as the forward elephants battled. It would seem one to one. So you have elephants charging each other, the first charge, over this salt plain. And as these elephants charge from both sides in, the, in this battle, a great, a great salt dust arises and none, neither of the armies can see each other. Antigonus then makes a strategic move. Eumenes had left, had made a crucial mistake. He'd left over here his baggage train, undefended, relatively undefended. This baggage train was, it was not just their food and stores, it was the belongings of the silver shields. These silver shields having fought for Alexander the Great for decades, it was everything they'd ever worked for and won over their decades of fighting for Alexander. It was 
Not only everything they'd owned and won through their whole careers, it was their wives and children, their families. And Eumenes has left all of this relatively unprotected. So Antigonus makes a strategic move and as this dust cloud has covered the field of battle, he sends out a portion of his army and they take the baggage train. So this battle was not a victory for Antigonus. If anything, it was a stalemate. There wasn't a great um, conclusion for either side. But what Antigonus had was the belongings of the silver shields. Now he had their wives and children and a lifetime uh, worth of winnings from their campaigns. So what Antigonus did was he went to the silver shields and he said, if you want all of this back, your families and everything you've ever earned, you have to give up Eumenes. And Eumenes was given up by his own men. He did not lose in battle. So at the Battle of Gabini, you see Antigonus defeat Eumenes. with the assistance of two allies, Seleucus and Python. He defeats him from the inside by treachery, not in battle. And Eumenes is surrendered by his own men. After this occurs, Antigonus takes the title, is known as the master of Asia. Antigonus was already powerful. Eumenes was also extremely powerful. Once Antigonus has defeated Eumenes, now he is unrivaled since Alexander the Great. Extremely powerful general. He immediately begins to, after the death of Eumenes, who he, he has executed, he immediately begins to consolidate this power. He starts... Um, putting down any other generals in the east. He starts um, killing them if they look like they're building up any type of power base, essentially cementing his, his control. In this history after the Battle of Gabini, one of those generals who begins to, begins to uh, rise in power, start to build a power base, is Python this fellow. So Python begins to build a power base. And while this is no real threat to Antigonus, he's starting to do this across, uh, across the empire and he has Python killed. Around the same time that he's had Python killed and is subjecting all these other satrapies, he takes a visit to Babylon and visits Seleucus. And Seleucus sees Antigonus coming and Antigonus is seeming to be friendly, but Seleucus knows how Antigonus is consolidating power and he knows that his life is in danger. So he abandons Babylon and flees by horse to Ptolemy. And this is when Seleucus goes back to Ptolemy gives up his entire satrap and starts to warn our other generals exactly the type of dictatorship that Antigonus is becoming. Quoting from A.T. Jones' Great Empires of Bible Prophecy, After the death, death of Eumenes, Antigonus considered himself master of all Asia and began to destroy all governors who possessed any considerable ability of whom Python was one, he attempted to destroy Seleucus with the others, but Seleucus escaped and went to Ptolemy and showed him what Antigonus was designing. They also sent this same information to Lysimachus and Cassander, and these formed a league against Antigonus. This is the beginning of the Third Diadochi War. These generals are coming into a league against Antigonus. A.T. Jones would say that these all four formed a league against Antigonus. I would argue that Seleucus is not one of them. At this 
this point, he's merely a general of Ptolemy. He has no territory and no authority. The three that had territory and power at that time are Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy. And Seleucus is fighting for Ptolemy. Antigonus was the sole ruler in the east and the strongest of any general. Ptolemy was alarmed by the growth of his power, knowing that he would be unable to retain the independence of Egypt against the united forces of Asia. Antigonus and Ptolemy have for a long time had tension between them. Ptolemy warns Cassander and Lysimachus about Antigonus' control. And in the autumn, these three concluded an alliance against Antigonus and sent Antigonus an ultimatum. And what they're essentially saying to Antigonus is, we have helped you, supported you and encouraged you in your victories against Eumenes and in all of these wars and battles, so now share with us. And what they want him to do is spread out between them or divide up between them everything that he's won and earned. <coughs> so if he's taken all this territory that belonged to Eumenes, Ptolemy wants some of that, Cassander wants some and Lysimachus wants some. So essentially what they're saying to him is stop acting unilaterally. I would suggest start acting like a globalist. Of course, the man who had in three years' time conquered everything between the Aegean Sea and Iran was unwilling to give in. A new war broke out, the Third Diadochi War, in the spring of 315 BC. Antigonus immediately seized the initiative. He invaded Syria to secure Phoenicia with its naval resources which were needed for anyone who had to invade the Aegean world or Egypt. In the summer he laid siege to Tyre, which had become independent but was supported by Ptolemy. So there is an ultimatum from three allies, which is rejected by Antigonus, and instead Antigonus invades the territory that is under Ptolemy, not directly, but was under Ptolemy's sphere of influence. And I'm going back to the language that we've used throughout our study of the Fourth Diadochi War and World War II, the conflict being over sphere of influence. The reason for the ultimatum from the three allies was clear. This is from a book by Jeff Champion, Antigonus the One-Eyed, Greatest of the Successes. They feared that the size of Antigonus's armies and his resources would enable him to seize complete power. If Antigonus was allowed to do this, they would be removed from their positions or worse. Seleucus so gave them examples of himself, Python, Pusestus, who although they had performed services for or in the past been allies with Antigonus, they had been replaced in their satrapies by his close friends. So Antigonus had gone into these territories, destroyed the leadership and replaced them by allies connected to himself. This causes the Third Diadochi War and Antigonus invades the sphere of influence of Ptolemy. Much of this conflict first, as we suggested back here, first centred around Antigonus's, Antigonus versus Ptolemy. This was where the, the conflict lay and it had been an historic, historic tension between the two men that built up to this Third Diadochi War. And Antigonus's first act in this war is to attack Ptolemy's sphere of influence. If we were to break down that territory, here we had Egypt, It's down here that Antigonus is conquering. 
he takes, Antigonus takes all this territory in the Third Diadochi War and then he comes down to here. He's won, he's won victories, taken all this um, territory and then he leaves his son Demetrius. He leaves Demetrius to hold this territory that he's won and then Antigonus travels over to the west and starts, um, starts conflicting with Lysimachus and Cassander. So he's taken all of this, he leaves Demetrius to hold it. Demetrius has never fought a battle without, uh, without the direct supervision of his father. He's never fought alone before. He's never been given this responsibility. So he's, he's, he's still young and still inexperienced. Ptolemy marches out, determined to confront him. Antigonus is long gone. He's over here somewhere. So Ptolemy marches out to confront Demetrius, and Demetrius's generals say to him, you are not strong enough or experienced enough to face off against Ptolemy, and Demetrius won't listen to his own generals. So he fights Ptolemy at what is quite a famous battle, it's known as the Battle of Gaza. And Ptolemy undertakes this under the encouragement of Seleucus. Ptolemy was now encouraged by Seleucus to reconquer this area, this area known as Col Syria. And if you've watched the presentations throughout the year, you've known how much we've discussed Col Syria as being symbolic of that, the war over spheres of influence. In the early spring of 312 BC, Ptolemy led his army out of Egypt towards Gaza. There Demetrius was waiting for him. Ignoring the advice of his counsellors to avoid open battle against Seleucus and Ptolemy, two of the greatest generals of the time, the young Demetrius was determined to protect his father's territory. On a large plain, somewhere between the city of Gaza and the Besor River, the forces would clash. The Antigonid army suffered a crushing defeat. Gaza fell to Ptolemy's forces soon after the battle. Demetrius was humiliated. It was a devastating loss. With the remnants of his army, he withdrew into Phoenicia, while Ptolemy would march further into the Levant as far as Tyre. Thanks to Gaza, the fortune seemed to have tur turned in the favour of our three allies. So the Battle of Gaza. Ptolemy defeats Demetrius, the son of Antigonus, who fights against the advice of his generals. And it was a crushing defeat. Ptolemy then marches up. He's wiped out Demetrius. Demetrius has fled with a very broken army. What's left of it? And Ptolemy continues to march up. through Col Syria, retaking all of the territory he had lost. Because of the Battle of Gaza, because of this defeat of Antigonus, Seleucus now feels free and Seleucus takes a portion of, uh, of men loaned him by Ptolemy and goes back to ba Babylon and retakes the, uh, the Babylon he surrendered um, in this history. So because of this vi victory, Seleucus takes back Babylon. And we'll see that that was quite a process. Shortly afterward, however, Demetrius, uh, Antigonus came back to the aid of his son Antigonus came back to this area, rejoined his son who just faced crushing defeat and Antigonus marched down and took back all of this territory. <coughs> Immediately Antigonus joined him and together they recovered all of hollow Syria, Phoenicia and Palestine. As Ptolemy was being driven out, he broke down the defences of Akko, Samaria, Joppa and Gaza. 
and carried off another large company of Jews and planted them in Alexandria. So it's in this history you see all those, um, the, the second time all those Jews are taken down into Alexandria, 312 BC. Uh, that's quoting from A.T. Jones, Great Empires of Bible Prophecy 194.3. Uh, another quote, in late 312 Antigonus quickly recaptured all the territory that had been lost right up to the borders of Egypt. So Antigonus takes this territory all the way to the borders of Egypt. At this point, he's in a position where he could have marched into Egypt and fought Ptolemy directly and most likely have won. But he starts to hear news that Seleucus has gone back and taken Babylon because Babylon was under his control under a puppet dictator. So he hears now that Seleucus has used this battle of Gaza to take men and, and retake Babylon. So there's two distractions that Antigonus immediately has that stops him from marching into Egypt and taking, taking control of the country. The two distractions were, the, were Seleucus first of all Seleucus who'd, who'd retaken Babylon and second this company known as the Nabataeans. So Antigonus conquered all to the borders of Egypt. But he's going to conclude a peace here. what is known as the Peace of the Dynasts. The reason that he's going to conclude this peace is because he's facing threat from the Nabataeans. Now the Nabataeans are the direct descendants of Ishmael. They've come from the east and from, from this direction, from the desert way, the east, and have been harassing his army. Second to that, he's heard that Seleucus has retaken Babylon. This is from a website dedicated to the Nabataeans. It says, Josephus, the ancient Jewish historian, identified the Nabataeans with Ishmael's eldest son. He claimed that the Nabataeans lived through the whole country, extending from the Euphrates to the Red Sea. He refers to this area as Nabataean, or the area that the Nabataeans ranged in. Josephus goes on to say that it was the Nabataeans who conferred their names on the Arabian nations. Nabataeans, Arabian. By this statement, we can assume to mean that during his lifetime, the word Arabs and Nabataeans had become synonymous. Josephus lived and wrote during the time that the Nabataeans were presently in existence, and supposedly he obtained his information directly from the Nabataeans themselves. So he concludes Alexander, sorry, Antigonus, because of these two threats, uh, goes into peace talks with our three allies, Cassander, Lysimachus and Ptolemy, and they conclude the peace of the dynasts. This is where the third Diadochi war comes to an end. And then he starts to deal with these threats, particularly Seleucus. He takes his army and marches back to Babylon because he's made, he's made peace with the three allies. Seleucus is not one of them, so he's under no restraint to honour that with Seleucus. Now what begins is the Babylonian War. The Babylonian War was a, a war wedged between the third and the fourth Diadochi Wars. And this was a war over Babylon, as you might note, fought between Antigonus and Seleucus. And the conclusion of that, 
through quite a few strategic plays was Seleucus took Babylon and here historians mark the beginning of the Seleucid dynasty when he properly took the city and he begins to establish himself. This is the beginning of the Seleucid dynasty. And, and we, can, we can mark this, um, the peace of the dynasts in 311 BC. Because of this peace treaty, this peace of the dynasts, Cassander has the remaining family of Alexander the Great die. So this is the end of Alexander's, Alexander's lineage as well. And he has them killed, uh, Roxanne and Alexander's son, because he, once the generals are at peace, Alexander's lineage starts to become a threat. The idea that they would at one point hand over the kingdom to, a, to the son of Alexander. So the minute there is peace between the generals and it looks like they might have to give up territory to um, Alexander's lineage, Cassander has them killed. 311 to 309 BC, it's the Babylonian War. And then as we have discussed in prior presentations, 307, the fourth war begins against the same players, Antigonus versus the Allies. We'd already begun in our previous presentations to make some application. When we did World War II and we studied that application, what we noted was that in applying World War II to our time, it told us of 1989 and then 2014 and 2016 with the Battle of Ipsus or the invasion of Poland, depending on whether you want to refer to the Fourth Diadochi War or World War II. So this history of World War II in application has taken us from 1989 to 2014 and then 2016, the beginning of the war, the beginning of World War II, the um, beginning of the Western Front, at least, of World War II. And also the Battle of Ipsus, the 2016 election, um, 301 BC, this war between Antigonus and the Allies, that famous battle. And what I pointed out in our previous presentations, that in applying World War II and the Fourth War, it has left us of our 30-year history with a 25-year gap. And if World War I plus World War II equals World War III, and when I say World War I and World War II, I'm including the Diadochi Wars that point to them. If World War II is going to take us to the history of 2014 and 16 in our own dispensation, we're left with a 25-year gap and I suggested that the Third Diadochi War and World War I would give some indication of how we actually came to this place in the, in, in the beginning. And we started to look at our application um, in our prior presentations, but I'll quickly review that. We'd recognised Antigonus as being the king of the north. In this history, when we, be when we begin our reform line, we recognise that in this, in this point in time, which we mark from 1989 to 91, you have Antigonus, the king of the north or the United States, in a long ongoing war with the Soviet Union. I'm going to have to make space. So there's been this long ongoing war with the Soviet Union. And in the history of 1989 to 91, and I want to include that two, three year history, you see the United States defeat the Soviet Union. But as we've stressed throughout the last 14 months of presentation, when we come to our history, what does war look like? It looks different to what it did in World War I and World War II. What we face now is an information war. The United States and the Soviet Union never 
went into battle in 89 to 91 in any fashion that wasn't by proxy. So in 89 to 91, as the Soviet Union falls, how is the Soviet Union defeated? How was Eumenes defeated? From the inside. Antigonus was able to turn Eumenes' own men against, against him by controlling their wealth. And so when we come to 89 to 91, we see the United States defeat the Soviet Union and it's defeated it from the inside. In this history, Antigonus became the master of Asia, the sole superpower throughout Alexander's former empire. And in this history, you see the United States become the sole superpower. And we discussed that in some detail. How the great fear at that, at that point in history was what would this new world going to look like when it had been for so many years a bipolar world order. You'd had a bipolar world order, two superpowers, and the great debate was whether or not it will be multipolar, which is essential, essentially globalist, or will it become unipolar, headed by a, a powerful United States. And we see that what Reagan certainly wanted and what he, he um, publicly pushed for was this unipolar world order headed by the United States with power it had never before had. But as it defeats the Soviet Union, it has two key allies in this battle. The first one was the Vatican, John Paul II. We remember the Time magazine cover from that history. What was that Time magazine cover called? The Holy Alliance, showing how through the Solidarity Movement, Reagan and John Paul II had come into an alliance and worked together to undermine the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe. There's a second. Throughout this history, fighting on behalf of the United States, remember Seleucus didn't fight directly on behalf of Antigonus. It was more moral support. Uh, irritating Eumenes where he could, but someone did fight directly for him and that was Python. In this history in Afghanistan who fought directly for the United States was a Mujahideen. The Mujahideen in Afghanistan fighting on behalf of the United States. Operation Cyclone was a code name for the United States CIA program to arm and finance the Mujahideen in Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989. The United States viewed the conflict in Afghanistan as an integral Cold War struggle and the CIA provided assistance to anti-Soviet Mujahideen rebels through, through the Pakistani intelligence services in a program called Operation Cyclone. That's two different quotes. The United States defeated the Soviet Union by weakening it from the inside. It took hold of its resources. The people rose up and they overthrew their leadership. It did this in union with two allies, the papacy, John Paul II, and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the two um, most key allies. The alliance between the papacy and the United States fell apart soon after 1989. So. Just as this is happening, you see two things happen. First of all, the alliance between the United States and John Paul II begins to disintegrate. We reviewed that uh, just very briefly in our last uh, presentation, so I, I don't want to go into the whole Gulf War discussion. But you see in this history, John Paul II is telling the United States not to invade Iraq not to go to war in the Gulf and they essentially say you were helpful during the Cold War but essentially how they viewed John Paul's advice was just as that. Not, not, on, not that they needed to negotiate with him as some type of equal but some irritating advice to be ignored and he knew that and their relationship started to crumble. Also in this history you see the rise of the Mujahideen and who did they become? They became the Taliban. They become more and more powerful. Python began to consolidate his power base. 
The Mujahideen begin to consolidate their power base and in 1996 they take control of the government of the majority of Afghanistan under their uh, new moniker um, known as the Taliban. We're going to discuss 2001 in more detail, but we find that Antigonus responded against Python consolidating his power and he, he um, had him killed, he destroyed him. So in 2001, we find after the 9-11 attack, the United States invades Afghanistan and overthrows the Taliban. And I just want to note, when was their first major battle? The first major battle between the Taliban and the United States. I just want to see if I can print it. Battle of Mazar i Sharif. It was November 9 of 2001. The United States first fought uh, the Taliban in combat and won a quick and surprise victory taking over that strategic um, territory. The United States under George Bush was starting to act more and more, uh, again, unilaterally. In 2003, we have three allies or three powers come uh, to face off against them and warn them to stop. Um, we'll complete our application of that uh, when we finish World War I, but we might now go into World War I. So we've lined up the third Diadochi War in World War I, just as we did the fourth Diadochi War in World War II. And it was in wanting to understand World War I that we'd gone into the, the, the history of uh, 1989 to 91 to explain that how that um, history developed with the first Iraq war. So just to remind us, we mark this 10 year history before 1989 and we've tended to do that because this is the 10 years of the Afghanistan proxy war between the King of the North and the King of the South. But what you can particularly see in these 10 years that we've more recently begun discuss discussing is the moral majority and the role of church and state in this 10 year period. But I also want us to see how much else can be connected into this history. In 1979, you have the Iranian revolution. And then you have Iraq. You have a, another type of revolution in Iraq and Saddam Hussein became president. Due to their, um, due to another, a number of things that separate Iran from Iraq, they were immediately in conflict and they began, um, they began a war. The Iran-Iraq war from 19, uh, I think it began in 1980, soon after they took power and ended in 1988. So 1979, you have revolution in I Iran. They became um, the type of uh, religious country they are today and then this revolution in Iraq, Saddam Hussein becomes president of Iraq. And Iran and Iraq go to war in 1980. And that war lasts through 1988. And then we saw how in this Iran-Iraq war, Iraq had been funded to, in that war by um, particularly uh, Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. And how that debt and different uh, conflicts over oil started to create in the 1989 history tension between Iraq and Kuwait. 
So they have Iraq is in debt to Kuwait because of the Iran-Iraq war. And then in 1989, Kuwait wants their, their loaned money repaid and Iraq won't pay it back. Then they also have conflict over oil prices and slant drilling. So in 1989 they meet and the discussions do not go well and tension begins to rise between Iraq and Kuwait. In 1990 Iraq forces invaded Kuwait and they quickly, with that invasion of Kuwait, took over vast oil fields and it appeared, uh, some people suggested, they were also going to invade Saudi Arabia. In 1991 you have the United States respond, they invade um, they free Kuwait, invade Iraq, and we read, uh, read some quotes about what they actually did to Iraq in that crisis, that the extent to which uh, the Iraqi infrastructure was destroyed. We'd lined up, um, in that history, in the last presentation, we'd lined up the two Iraqi wars. So I won't review all that one now, but it, it becomes crucial to have that in the back of our minds as we go through the history of World War I. Because, as you might understand, the beginning of World War I is a complicated, um, was a complicated process, how that war developed. So just to try and draw out, what occurred in this early history of 1989 to 91. You have conflict between Iraq and Kuwait. The Kuwait is under the sphere of influence or less in that time but it comes under the sphere of influence of the United States. So in the Gulf War the United States takes Kuwait if I can just think how I can't quite remember how I drew that in this history, whose sphere of influence is Iraq under? It was under that of the Soviet Union. So Iraq had been under the support, the financial support and, and, um, and military aid of the Soviet Union. Kuwait was a bit more independent then, but Iraq wanted to take control of Kuwait, which they did. But when they did that, the United States intervened and they took Kuwait from Iraq. So we see this pattern, if we can have that in the back of our minds, as we consider how World War I developed. We know that there was prior history that led up to this conflict uh, to, to 1914 and World War I, and people say, co discuss different causes for World War I, but there's one key cause that I would like to suggest really escalated this more than any other, and that was the Bosnian crisis of 1908. In 1903, the King of Serbia had, Serbia had been assassinated in a coup and the pro-Russian dynasty came to the throne. Power shifted to elements widely interested in expansion into Bosnia. These Serbs wanted to take over uh, different territories that had been under the influence of Austria-Hungary. Relations between Serbia and Austria-Hungary gradually deteriorated. However, Russia's ability to support Serbia was greatly reduced following military humiliation in the 1905 Russian-Japanese War and the ensuing internal unrest. So to break that down, you have Serbia. And Serbia is under whose sphere of influence? Russia. 
So Serbia was under the sphere of influence of, of Russia. A pro-Russian dynasty had come to the throne and Russia really was the force <coughs> behind Serbia that um, made it in any way feel safe being as bold as they were. This pro-Russian dynasty that came into Serbia in 1903 really wanted to take territory, particularly Bosnia. Bosnia being independent but really under the sphere of influence of Austria-Hungary and Serbia wanted to spread into Bosnia. They were interested, interested in expanding their territory into Bosnia. They were supported by Russia but was Russia able to help them? No, Russia was going through their own internal revolution and they were too weak to defend their ally. And in this crisis you see Austria-Hungary take Bosnia as a sphere of influence from Serbi Serbia. So in the history of 1989 to 91 you have Iraq. It's supported by Russia but Russia is going through internal revolution and it's too weak to support its ally Iraq. Iraq wants Kuwait under its sphere of influence, but the United States, a two-horned two power, will not let it. And the United States, States takes Kuwait from Iraq. The history of 1908. Serbia is under Russia's sphere of influence. Russia is going through internal revolution. It's the breakdown of the Soviet Union. It cannot be protected or defended by the Soviet Union. It wants to take, did I just do this one or this one? The bottom one. Iraq wants to take Kuwait from the United States, take control of Kuwait, but the United States t takes Kuwait as a sphere of influence. Kuwait has been dependent on US protection ever since. And this is the cause of conflict that comes after. This first Iraq war, the Gulf War, is what developed into the conflict that we see from 2001 and through this history and I want us to see that how this this Gulf War is was really a catalyst for much of what comes um, after all the way through our history so this two th 1908 Bosnian crisis it was a catalyst for what developed into the First World War so you have Serbia and Iraq they want Bosnia or Kuwait weak countries on their own. They're taken from their control by the United States or Austria-Hungary, two horned powers. They have the King of the South or Russia behind them, but because of Russia's internal problems, it cannot come to their aid. Serbia appealed to Russia in 1908, but Nicholas would not go to war with Austria-Hungary because of his own internal weakness. And Serbia was forced to recognise Austria's right to Bosnia. This was known as the Bosnian crisis. Serbia has big plans. They want to unite all of that territory, or all of the Slav states in Eastern Europe into one entity. And they want to unite all of those states under their leadership or their sphere of influence. And Austria-Hungary sees this as a threat. We've already lined up Austria-Hungary. In this history, we have really two aspects of the King of the North. In the Fourth Diadochi War, it's Antigonus. Against the three allies. The same players. In the First and the Second World War, it's the same. It's Germany against the Allies. But we also see in this history of World War I another entity connected with Germany, which is Austria Hungary. And it gives us a symbology of the King of the North. I would suggest both representing the United States, but what Austria-Hungary gives us is a symbology of a two-horned power and that two-horned power actually coming to its end. 
So Austria sees Serbia as a threat because Serbia wants to unite much of that territory under its, all those Slav states under themselves. Iraq also being a threat, they really wanted to unite the Middle East under their own um, power. Some of those in Bosnia, it actually began out of, out of Bosnia, not Serbia. Some of the Slav people were unhappy with this Austrian-Hungary Austria -Hungary, uh, control. So Austria-Hungary takes control of Bosnia. Slavs within Bosnia become angry at the control of Austria-Hungary and they form what was known as the Black Hand Gang. This is a terrorist organisation. So out of this conflict, this annexation, so, so, um, Slavs within Bosnia form a terrorist organisation, the Black Hand. On June 28, 1914, they struck. And this was the assassination of Arch Archduke Franz Ferdinand. It really sprung out of this crisis because of the behaviour of Austria-Hungary taking over Bosnia. Slavs within Bosnia form a terrorist organisation. June 28 of 1914, they strike, they assassinate the Archduke and that's the, really the final, final, um, last straw before World War I. But I want us to note that you know already that we're lining that up with a terrorist organisation that formed in this history, Al-Qaeda. And that Al-Qaeda undertook a terrorist attack at 9-11. So we're lining up the cause with the terrorist attack, the cause with the terrorist attack. But we know that in this history, prior to George or during George Bush's election, he'd already stated emphatically that he already planned a war with Iraq. He already wanted to, to go to war with Iraq and overthrow Saddam Hussein. Also, his own legacy issues from his father's war back in 89 to 91. So George Bush already wanted a war with Iraq. The same exact same dynamic occurs here. In 1913, a telegram was sent. Um, between Austria, Hungary and Italy and it, I'll just, uh, where, where the Austrians told the Italian government that they, that they intended to invade Serbia. The Italian Prime Minister in 1914 cited this fact to claim that the telegram he received in 1913 indicates that the assassination of the Archduke was the occasion rather than the cause of the war between Austria, Hungary and Serbia. And it reveals the reason for Austria's actions invading Serbia in July of 1914. In fact, the Austrian Chief of Staff, General Hutzendorf, had asked for a surprise war to destroy Serbia more than 25 times in the eight years from 1916, so 1906 to 1914. So Austria-Hungary already wanted a war. This was the, in their words, occasion rather than the cause. And this is the occasion rather than the cause of the Iraq war. Those within George Bush's government already wanted to overthrow Saddam Hussein. In 2003, we see an ultimatum. And in this history, we saw an ultimatum. After the terrorist attack, uh, the assassination of the Archduke, Austria-Hungary sent Serbia an ultimatum. And they had told them to fulfil a certain list of requirements that were so 
extensive, there was no way that Serbia could fulfil them. So in this ultimatum from Austria-Hungary to Serbia, they pretty much are asking for complete control of Serbia itself, as essentially Serbia would just become a puppet of Austria-Hungary. And Serbia actually fulfills the majority of their requirements, but all of them. They fulfill so many that the rest of the, the relevant countries feel that war has been averted. Serbia has fulfilled enough of the requirements. Austria-Hungary couldn't possibly continue with their, um, with their threats of war. So much of the world thought that this war wasn't actually going to happen. Serbia having fulfilled the majority of the requirements. But it occurred regardless. And July 28, exactly a month after the assassination of the Archduke, Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia. July 28, 1914. And this is the beginning of World War I. One month to the day after Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria and his wife were killed in, in Sarajevo, 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 Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia, effectively beginning the First World War. The problem is, as Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia, who was Serbia, who was Serbia under? Who was Serbia a sphere of influence of? Russia. Back in this history, was Russia strong enough to defend their country, to defend Serbia against Austria-Hungary? No, but you come over to this, Hungary, to this history and Russia has been gaining in strength. So now Russia feels fit to respond. And as we all know, this descended into a war on two fronts. Austria-Hungary invades Serbia, Russia declares war. And you have a war on two fronts, east and west. So from July 28, 1914, there's this war between Austria, Hungary and Germany and um, the Triple Entente. So they're not known as the Allies in this history, they're known as the Triple Entente. Still three powers. This was a history of three powers, Cassander, Lysimachus and Ptolemy. This is the history of the three powers, the Triple Entente, against Germany and Austria-Hungary. So you have this war between Germany and Austria-Hungary and the Triple Entente that sparked because of this conflict over Serbia. And Germany starts to become starts to think of a clever strategy of how to bring this war to an end. It's been going on for a number of years. Germany starts thinking of another way that they can bring this war on the Eastern Front to a conclusion. Uh, we might stop and have a prayer and then we will have a short break and we'll come back and, and conclude our study. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you that through history you give us a clearer vision of where we are. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to understand that while history can be complicated, We'll understand the thread that you're wishing us to, to um, observe. Please bless the remainder of our fellowship and our worship together. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.